Okay. Um, hi, I'm Lucy. Uh, if you guys want to grab a seat, but also you're free to stand and uh, snack while I talk. Um, yeah, so I'm Lucy. I think we're looking around. I've met most of you so far already. I'm a PhD student in Southampton, and my voice is weird because the air conditioning is killing me. Um, so I talk about research and Arabic Wikipedia. Um, I'm a researcher. I mainly work with uh, structured data and NLP. So this presentation, some of you might have heard my presentation yesterday, so some of us are a bit repetitive. I just tried to focus a bit more on how we can use particularly NLP, so natural language processing work and research to support um, Arabic Wikipedia in this case. So um, we will talk, so that's the general structure. Oh yeah, so, so my presentation is together with Hadi, who prepared this slide, so um, I'm very sorry if I get to this. Like, uh, I'm uh, not, not so sure about things, but um, yeah, I'll try to make my points and please ask questions. Also, if you don't, some it's very research specific, so if you don't understand something in between, feel free to just, I mean, we're few enough to just ask questions in the middle as well. So, um, <coughs> uh, we, I will talk a bit about why we need research in, in Arabic Wikipedia or in small language or under resourced Wikipedias in general and then talk a bit about the research topics and I'll plug my scribe project in the end as always. Um, so there is this idea that Wikipedia should represent the sum of all of human knowledge and uh, we question that. So there's a lot of human knowledge that we can't represent and on the same time that's at the moment not accessible to everyone. Um, so if you look at the language distribution of articles and active users on Wikipedia, we can see there's an extreme mild distribution. So English is really well represented, while Arabic is, uh, has a lower, a lot lower number of articles and editors, even though it's the fifth most spoken language in the world, as all of you probably know. Um, we did some experiments with Esperanto as well, which is a made up language, that's why Esperanto is on that slide as well. Um, and yeah, so, so we have a language gap, so Martin was presenting uh, a lot about this in the maps in the first day of Wiki Arabia. Um, we have this problem that very few articles at the moment are written about a place, are written by locals. Uh, there was a presentation just before the break as well about uh, the cultural context articles. And um, generally we have an information poverty in Wikipedia, meaning there are more articles about Japan, which is a relatively small country, than about the entire Middle East. Um, which leads us to this vicious cycle of like we have few editors to edit content about it, um, we have few articles about it, so we have few readers from which we can recruit editors. Um, and then there's also this idea of information poverty, so um, that's relevant, so that the articles that would be relevant to large parts of the world are not represented in Wikipedia at the moment. So what we look to, into is uh, solutions to this information poverty and particularly what research can do and what research is already doing and how we can reuse it. Um, at the moment we have automatic machines translation in the form of the content translation tool and I want to represent three alternatives in particular, in particular natural language generation which is work we actually did. Uh, summarization, cross-lingual word embeddings which is just topics in the, in the world of research. Um, so first of all, we have the content translation tool. This also has been presented on Wiki Radio already. Um, so the content translation tool relies mostly on automatic machine translation. Uh, so we have Google Translate and Yandex Translate. Um, and yeah, that's, that's an overview of how the, how the tool works. You have on the, I mean, I guess most of you have used it before. You have the original article and then you can translate it to the target language. So uh, we call this in research a machine translation with human in the loop because we have this machine translation that's automatic automatically generated and then we have the human in the loop that's post-editing uh, the translation which can be a very tedious task. Um, but the machine translation is extremely successful at the moment. So we have a large number of articles created um, from through the translation tool, so that's a very good direction but it fails very much in representing. So the first problem with it is it fails representing uh, the, the languages in the world because 
There are just very many languages that are, so we have 301 languages on Wikipedia. We have only 103 languages on Google Translate, which is one of the best machine translation tools we have at the moment. And so there are two to 6,000 languages in the world in general. So machine translation cannot cover everything, of course. And there is a lack of quality, especially in low resource languages when it comes to machine translation. So uh, how machine translation works basically is it has two, you have two data, you have data sets, which is the original language and the target language, and you train on that. If you have not enough parallel data, so data that's aligned word by word, you have very poor quality. And one of the problems with all resource languages, obviously in the first place, there's not enough content online. Um, and this poor quality makes translation very little useful and very tedious for editors to post edit. Um, and then we have, uh, so another problem of machine translation is the translation of labels. So this example, for example, is a, is a person. Um, I think the king of uh, uh, the Zulus, exactly. And so um, their first name, or his first name is um, Goodwill, which is basically like a compound noun or something, um, but it is just a name. Uh, if you put it into translation tools, it will translate it wrongly. It will take it as two words and translate those two words one by one instead of detecting that's a name. So that's what we call a label. So his name is a label, which you would want to keep basically by itself. Um, so that's the, that's the issues with the current machine translation we have. Um, one of the ideas to overcome that and which is rapidly growing at the moment is unsupervised machine translation, um, where you don't need parallel copyright and it's very suitable for, for small languages. Um, and the other problem, so that, that's like one of the research directions that's out there. Uh, the problem with translation generally, though, it is that it will not solve the information poverty. So, meaning uh, large language Wikipedia's get to decide what's not will. You translate, you have an extreme cultural bias because you translate from one uh, context, and small language Wikipedia's um, repeat, repeat this bias basically. Um, <coughs> And then also, so I made this point uh, yesterday already, that translation of English references also harms the neutral point of view. So we have in this example, Ala Salah, who is a student protester in Sudan, and uh, her article is uh, translated with machine translation, with the content translation tool, and we can see that a vast majority of the references are in English and French, I believe, um, even though it's a, it's a topic very, important to the Arab-speaking world. Uh, even in those topics, we have very little referencing to actual Arabic references, which means we always represent the outside view on a topic, and at the same time, it's very hard to fact-check for monolingual speakers. So that's automatically integrated, though, if you use content translation. So I, I, made, a, I made a table with all the, the possible things we're going to talk about. So just to recap, so we machine translation helps us cover the language gap. It doesn't help us with the information poverty, neither with the reference bias. The quality is, depends very much on what language you're working with. Um, it helps though, it is very good when you want to create long articles, obviously, because you can translate the entire article. Um, so the next point I'm going to go into is the natural language generation. Um, this is something we worked on, so the idea is to say we have structured data, for example, in the form of uh, Wikidata, and we generate text for Wikipedia. Uh, we, have, we use an encoder-decoder model that is very similar to the ones with machine translation. The difference, though, is that we, instead of feeding the original language to create the target language article, we feed into the model Wikidata Wiki triples, and generate one to two sentences. Um, we create those, there's a process uh, how to annotate the data, and annotating the data become, becomes very easy, and it's very scalable across languages, basically because you just align Wikidata triples with existing Wikipedia articles. Uh, this helps by, this helps to generate text that really sounds as if an Arabic Wikipedia editor wrote it, because we only train, so the model only ever sees Arabic text, uh, in Wikipedia, so that's also a bit of a difference to machine translation in, uh, from English to Arabic because 
we found that Arabic sentences on Wikipedia, for some reason, are a lot longer in average than on English. So we don't like we don't uh, change how people write, basically. Um, so it helps a lot. So this natural language generation idea helps a lot when you want to integrate the Wikidata knowledge um, uh, that is already out there. It's for free, basically. We have the data anyway. Um, it works better than machine translation for small languages, <coughs> and especially it works very good for short text. Um, and the translation of names, so what I was saying with goodwill before, this is ensured to be correct because we just align it with the Wikidata entity. Um, the problem though is that natural language generation at its current stage of research is terrible when it comes to more than one paragraph. So there has been tests to generate a whole Wikipedia article, it just doesn't work at the moment. And another important problem which we found when we interviewed editors um, when we did this work is that uh, it makes factual mistakes. So it would say, for example, uh, we generated a sentence on Marrakesh and it would say Marrakesh is in the very north of Morocco. And um, this becomes very tricky because I didn't see that because my Arabic is really bad. And when we interviewed the editors, there is a certain trust into Wikipedia that they overread factual mistakes. So even the people we interviewed that were from Morocco didn't catch that. Um, so yeah, just to recap, so we can use that uh, to reduce the language gap. It also helps with information poverty because we can create anything that's on Wikidata, which might be not as biased towards English. We can help with references because we can only use the references in Wikidata and they are biased towards English slightly. It's a good quality, but it's very bad for long text generation. Um, so another approach we were thinking of to generate content is to summarize documents. So um, basically what you do in multi-document summarization is you have a long list of documents, of, let's say references online, and you summarize them into one article um, in particular. So there are certain features you use to understand how to summarize something, what's important. You want to minimize the redundancy of your newly generated article. You want to maximize the relevance, of, obviously, and informativeness. Um, there is a long list of papers we use for this presentation. I'm very happy to do that afterwards. Um, and so summarization is a nice idea in theory, but obviously, so it, it checks all our boxes, but what happens obviously is that you don't really create original content, right? Like you just summarize other information, which is a bit what editors do as well, but we don't have the ability yet to not plagiarize, basically. We will just copy sentences together. And then, so finally, a very big topic when it comes to lower resource languages at the moment in research is cross-lingual transfer learning. Um, it sounds really funky, it's relatively easy, but it's a very nice idea. So basically, what happens typically when you want to represent words of natural language in, uh, research, in, in computer science research or in NLP research is that you map them into a vector space. So each word is a space, a point in a space, in a 3D space, and then we can align, so we do that for English, let's say, and we do that for Arabic, and then we can lay, lay them on top of each other, and we find what's the closest words, and that's basically like a bilingual dictionary. Um, and so now we can use that for cross-lingual transfer learning, meaning that we can train neural network, for example, on one language, so we can train it on English, and then try to apply this to another task, to the same task in another language. So we can say we make a model that knows how to uh, translate or uh, not translate, how to generate articles in English, and that works quite well. Now, through the fact that we have those aligned dictionaries, um, we can now just apply it in our example to Zulu. Um, this is really nice for super small languages, so this might not be as interesting for Arabic because it's especially interesting for languages where, let's say, your, your Wikipedia has like 15 articles or something. And then that's where it becomes super relevant. And so basically what you do there is you use existing datasets, for example, in English, which is really well covered, just apply it to another language. Um, so what you can use it for, one of the things you can use it for is uh, reference retrieval. And so that's, that's why we mostly focused here. So you can retrieve references, you can learn 
what's an important, so from English Wikipedia you learn what's an re important reference, and then you just apply the same task around the languages. Um, okay, now I'm shamelessly plugging our project, uh, which is Scribe, and <coughs> Scribe tries to include a few of the factors that we've seen with all the other research things. So we basically take all the knowledge that's around on the web already, we try to summarize it. Uh, so the reference retrieval idea basically, we try to get references from different languages, filter them, summarize them, have a human in the loop approach. Because So that's something I found a lot when looking in the research world versus the Wikipedia world. So the research always tries to do everything purely with computers, with machines, with machine learning, which is stupid, right? Because, I mean, the cool thing about Wikipedia is that we have so many great editors that do a lot of important and really valuable work. And then we can use it for the target Wikipedia. That's a really old mock-up, so I'm jumping to the real one. Um, so that's the idea is basically for Scribe. Uh, we use a few of those ideas, as I said, so we learn how, what's, the, what's typical section titles in the language, uh, the, in the target language, as an editor, you can select the ones you want. Um, you can write uh, your article section by section, and for each section, we suggest your references. So that's, for example, I think Nile University in Egypt. Um, that's pretty much all. It's a very short overview of everything. Um, ask questions, but also if you're interested in research on Wikipedia, uh, how Wikipedia can collaborate more with researchers and the other way around, how researchers can help Wikipedia more, please come to me, uh, I'm very interested to hear what you say, and thank you so much for having me. Cool, cool. any questions? Great. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, yes. Could you say a little more about that 3D mapping model? I yeah. think that power how one language can be useful. Okay, so so basically what you do uh, when you when you do this word embeddings is that so you have this you take some text and you learn how words are in a relationship to each other. Right. And this relationship you display in this 3D model basically. Right. And you do this for two separate languages. And you use so you then can uh, lay them on top of each other, and you turn them a bit, so you need some form of bilingual dictionary first. Ah, that's the exactly. part. Exactly, yeah, okay. yeah. And then as soon as you have that, you have it aligned for all the words that you trained on. So using an existing human-made bilingual dictionary, sure. yeah. you use the, the, the collocations in the different languages. Exactly, so you then you have some words where you know those should be really close to each other, or they are the same. Yeah. And then all the surrounding words you can map to each other. How strong the learning rate is, or is it like you can, for example, we can take like a very small language? Does it apply very much? Yes, exactly. So, so all of those. So this like cross-lingual transfer learning idea was made for super small languages. So. Uh, Zulu, for example, has barely any content online. Um, with the few articles you have and the few dictionaries you have, you can already transfer learn on different tasks, basically. So you can map, because with all the words you then have in the text, you can train those uh, word embeddings. You can display them. And, yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you very much.